everyone, wherever you are in the country. Uh, thank you for joining us on this webinar. Um, it's a, a really special webinar <clears throat> we have uh, today. Um, a lot of really good information, so I'll try and be brief. I'm also trying to get over a cough myself, so try not to take too long. But um, <clears throat> the, the webinar today with Judge uh, Robert Russell and Judge, Judge Vance Peterson um, we'll just be going over the role of the the, the treatment court, veteran treatment court judge, uh, and veteran treatment courts. Um, it'll cover a lot of other topics, um, including um, some some things about mentors. Um, so I, I know I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, and also, as Monica mentioned, this will be archived um, on our website, and we'll have it on YouTube as well as the other um, uh, veteran treatment court webinars that we have um, that we've had uh, previously. So. Um, we'll be sending out links to those uh, also. So uh, without much further ado, I will turn it over to Judge Robert Russell and Judge Vance Peterson. Now, hello, everyone. This is Judge Robert Russell, and I want to thank uh, Monica and Kerwin and American University for sponsoring this webinar. In addition, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, Judge Vance Peterson. We're going to discuss the role of the Veterans Treatment Court judge and how that role differs from the role of an adult drug court judge. Uh, part of what we're going to be exploring is what makes these courts different, the planning for a Veterans Treatment Court, the operation of a Veterans Treatment Court, and also military culture. I'll be moving through these slides uh, fairly quickly because we have a number of slides that give us uh, hopefully some viable information that will be of assistance to the field in establishing their own Veterans Treatment Court. But what makes them different? Well, one big factor is the participants that we'll be working with in Veterans Treatment Court, their prior experiences are different. The type of services and the array of services they're expanded, they're specific to our veteran participants, and they're catered to veterans. In addition, the contribution of having men and women who worn the uniform, veterans, to volunteer as veteran mentors is unique to our justice system, and it's critical to a Veterans Treatment Court operation. What about our participants' prior experience? their journey. And okay, oh, there we go. It's uh, remembering our participant sacrifice. And President George Washington uh, once stated that the willingness for which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive the veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by their nation. And it's important and, and critical when we think about it. Our men and women who serve in the United States military uh, represent approximately 1% of our nation's population. But these, this 1% sacrifice of themselves uh, to do this type of task. And to do that, it's important that our nation shows our appreciation by helping them in reintegrating back home. When we look at the most recent conflict post 9-11, we realized that over 2 million of our men and women that served in the armed forces have been deployed, whether it's uh, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, uh, Kuwait, number of other jurisdictions around the world. And many of them have served multiple deployments. Over one million are currently separated and back home. Also, how the Reserve and National Guard have been utilized since post 9-11. The number of reservists and National Guard that's been activated to support the conflicts in these jurisdictions. Some of the signature injuries that we hear about in this conflict is post-traumatic stress disorder. You have a listing of some of the symptoms and how our men and women, based upon what they've seen, observed, been engaged in, really affects 
their mental health and mental stability. Uh, you're talking about not only post-traumatic stress disorder, but major anxiety, major depression for some. Traumatic brain injury, an external force which cause injury to the brain that some of our participants we may see in our program may be suffering from not only post-traumatic stress disorder, but some from traumatic brain injury as a result of improvised explosive devices that may have caused injuries to our participants' brain. The number of our veterans <laughs> that we are aware of that suffer homelessness, and it's a shame that they risk their lives for us and in service to this country, and to be able to come home and not have a home. And we realize also through national data statistics that criminal involvement is the single best predictor of future homelessness. The employment, unemployment rate for a number of our veterans, and particularly our young veterans of age 18 to 24, employment, unemployment rate exceeds that of our civilian population. Some of our veterans may have experienced and suffer from military sexual trauma. Also, what is unique after 9-11, the number of our female veterans that serve in the military, making up 15% of today's military, the number of female veterans that's been deployed and served in Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom in Iraq and Afghanistan, special issues that we need to be mindful of of some of our female veterans. The fact of them going off to serve, being deployed, leaving children at home, not accessing a number of our female veterans, not accessing uh, veteran benefits that they earn through their service and other female-related issues. What about the number of our veterans? And some of the statistics and data reveals that 22 have taken their own life than in service in combat. But we know what a resilient group that we do have. Veterans are used to and accustomed to, which differs from uh, many in our general population that we may see in our criminal justice system. But veterans are used to structure, trained in leadership, trained in loyalty, patriotism, camaraderie, and teamwork, and self-reliance. Uh, it's a matter of us in Veterans Treatment Court environment tapping to that spirit and tapping to that culture that Judge Peterson will be speaking about shortly. The services that we work with in Veterans Treatment Court are expanded from what we typically uh, see in working in an adult drug treatment court model, where including services that are specific and catered to our veterans' population. When we think about veterans' treatment court, it's comprised of unique components such as a court entirely of men and women who served in the military, having physically present uh, individuals from our United States Department of Veteran Affairs, veteran health care workers, uh, veterans justice outreach workers and veteran services, having men and women from our community who volunteer as veteran mentors, creating, of course, this therapeutic environment to help them in regaining stability in their life. Also, what's unique about a veterans treatment court that differs from a drug treatment court is that a veterans treatment court is a hybrid drug and mental health treatment court. We're not looking at solely whether someone is dependent on alcohol or other substances, but we're working with some who their primary diagnosis and maybe their only diagnosis is one of a mental health disease and disorder. Non-traditional resources that we incorporate and see in the Veterans Treatment Court, as mentioned, representatives from our United States Department of Veteran Affairs, representatives from our United States or even your State Department of Labor, 
to help and assist veterans with employment, job training skills, our resume writing, things of that sort, our representatives from our State Department of Veteran Affairs, and a number of our community veteran service organizations, such as Veterans of Foreign Wars, the BFW, um, American Veterans, AMBETS, uh, Vietnam Veterans of America, Purple Heart Association, uh, Disabled Vets of America, and so on and so forth that may exist in your community. Now let's uh, talk a little bit about the representative from the United States Department of Veteran Affairs that is working or you hope to work with your court. What can they do and assist you with? Uh, a lot of times many jurisdictions who will be assigned to work with your court is a representative called a VJO, and that is a Veterans Justice Outreach employee. Their duty is to be the liaison between the VA healthcare network and, in addition, your court. They're able to provide updated information on their status at the VA healthcare network, uh, assist you with their level of care, whether it's inpatient, whether it's outpatient, whether it's in the domiciliary, they're a critical part of the work we do in Veterans Treatment Court. In addition, in order to be able to have updated information on the progress of a veteran at the VA, it's important that we have release of confidentiality with respect to their health care records. They're able to assist with the obtaining of the VA releases for information. Uh, they do the linkages for VA services. They do a tremendous amount of coordination in providing not only the status report uh, with regards to treatment, toxins, scheduling an appointment for them, and also assisting with case management and crisis management. And some it could be for our veterans that might be homeless with regards to getting them into safe, habitable housing and accessing other benefits. Also, as our Veterans Treatment Court work with the uh, Department of Veteran Affairs Veterans Benefit Office and the VBA Veteran Service Representatives for the Veteran uh, Benefit Office also is a liaison to our Veterans Treatment Court. They assist with obtaining releases. They facilitate the process of review of the pension disability that our veterans have earned through their service and also review of potential errors or corrections on a veteran's discharge status of their DD-214. Uh, uh, General uh, Butch Tate has once said that he believes the secret sauce to Veterans Treatment Court is having veteran mentors, men and women who served in the military who is willing to volunteer and assist another veteran in getting their life back on track and stability. Well, why Veterans Treatment Court? Uh, to me, it's looking at how do we afford the best opportunity for success for our veterans that we see in our criminal justice system and providing the best opportunity for them. Abraham Lincoln stated, our president, that uh, for our veterans and those that have served, it's important that we care for him or her who shall borne the battle and for his widows and his orphans. How do we plan a veterans treatment court? When we talk about planning a veterans treatment court, it's important for each jurisdiction to examine and explore who do we want at our planning meetings. Who should be at the table? Who needs to be included for us to have not only the maximum benefit for what we're going to do in this program, but also to have buy-in from our community leaders? Our, we need to have a working committee in order to achieve the goals that we have in mind for our Veterans Treatment Court. But when we're planning, some of the discussions you're going to have is who should come into our Veterans Treatment Court program? And we use the term target population. Who's going to be 
your target population? Who do you want to serve? Is it going to be veterans that have um, mental health disease or disorder? Is it going to be veterans that are dependent on substances? Is it a combination of both? What if a veteran has a traumatic brain injury? Are you working with those veterans? And if we say we want to work with this population, a big issue is going to be how do we identify who this target population is? It's not readily apparent who's a veteran that comes through our criminal justice system. So we need to begin to think and analyze in what way, in what earliest point can we begin to identify a veteran's coming through our justice system. And I'll be talking about it shortly on what would be helpful to assist us in identifying what veterans are coming uh, into our criminal justice system. The other question is, now that we said we want to start this court, we've identified what veterans we would like to target and have involved with us in the Veterans Treatment Court program. We done discuss on what steps we're going to take to identify veterans coming through our uh, criminal justice system. The other question is fine. We done identified it. We done set out who should come into our program. We done looked at not only uh, the type of cases we're going to be working with, type of criminal offenses that we're going to be working with. We also need to be able to work out how does that case get to your courtroom? How does that case get to a Veterans Treatment Court program? Are you accepting cases not only within uh, your district, but are other courts around that district sending cases to you? If so, we need to work out a mechanism on how that case reaches from one courtroom to your courtroom. Who makes the decision on who comes into Veterans Treatment Court? Who's the gatekeeper? Is there a sole party who's the gatekeeper? Like in some jurisdiction, they might say, well, the prosecuting attorney makes the decision on who comes into Veterans Treatment Court because they are the ones who's going to uh, make the, uh, offer the carrot for successful participation in Veterans Treatment Court. That carrot could be dismissal of the charges. It could be reduced charges from felonies to misdemeanors, whatever it is. Someone needs to kind of think about who's going to be the gatekeeper. Or is it a group consensus? In other words, with the defense, with the prosecution, with the judge, with other team members who you include as part of your uh, planning team and part of your <clears throat> general operating team <clears throat> that makes the decision, this case will be accepted in the Veterans Treatment Court. <clears throat> and what's the minimum length of your program? Are they going to bring in your program minimally? Uh, a year? Is it 18 months? Is it two years? Whatever you decide, the length of period of time that in order to complete the program, they must at a minimum be in your program for this length of time, <clears throat> there has to be some carrot or benefit why a veteran would choose to come in the Veterans Treatment Court rather than have their case go through the regular criminal justice process. What is the carrot? What's the incentive? And that needs to be decided at the planning stage. Now, when we talk about who we're targeting and who should be admitted into the Veterans Treatment Court program, it's important that we begin to write down and have written instructions on what is the eligibility criteria for entering into Veterans Treatment Court. We need to develop objective criteria and move past subjective criteria. Let's write down clearly defined characteristics of what would qualify a veteran for your Veterans Treatment Court program. It's important to also consider how many people can you serve in your Veterans Treatment Court? 
the court itself and having a court calendar for veterans treatment court, how many do you, veterans do you think you can handle on your calendar? Is there an issue with regards to treatment capacity? And a lot of times that may not be the case since um, it's, uh, they're going to be serviced, many of them, if not most, at the uh, VA for their health care. But it might be an issue on treatment capacity for your jurisdiction. Is there an issue with regards to political capacity? That being, well, we think when we begin it that we want to start off small to see how the program is moving along to build up political capital as to why this is an important and needed component for what we're doing in the criminal justice system in your jurisdiction. And the willingness and the capacity to be able to help if people are in your program monitored by uh, community supervision or probation of some sort, is there a limit on the capacity that they're going to be able to uh, supervise a veteran? And how many cases they can have on their caseload would brings about a consideration of we can only accept so many people into our Veterans Treatment Court program. Policy consideration. What type of, we talk about the individual and the clinical diagnosis of the individual, but we also need to consider what are the types of cases we're going to handle. Are we taking felony cases? Are we taking misdemeanor cases? Or are we taking a combination of both? Is there an issue with regards to that a veteran must be a resident in your jurisdiction in order to uh, come into Veterans Treatment Court program? Drug-motivated offenses, such as theft-related offenses, things of that sort. Their level of alcohol or drug dependency involvement? Are you working with cases of addiction where they're dependent on these substances? Are you working with some that may not be dependent but merely have an abuse of substances where they may not need that intense programming that you have in your typical treatment courts? What about the mental health, the post-traumatic stress disorder, the uh, major depression, anxiety. What about if there's a diagnosis of bipolar, schizophrenia? Do you have a will, desire to assist and help these veterans in regaining stability in their life? What if they're uh, co-occurring disorders of both dependency and mental health issues, substance issues? What about domestic violence cases? Will you work with them in Veterans Treatment Court? Or as a policy-wise, you're not. What about weapon offenses, possession of weapons? What about violent offenses? These are all policy considerations that as a team you're going to want to think about and develop what's going to be, uh, what is the will of our jurisdiction, what is the will of our planning committee, and working with veterans seen in our local criminal justice community. It's important when we talked about earlier on is how do we identify a veteran? Uh, because a veteran is not distinguishable by appearance unless they're wearing a uniform when they're arrested and come through the criminal justice system. So we need to be begin to think about how do we identify a person as having served in the United States military. It's important that we begin to ask the right question and we ask it early on in the process. We ask it at the time that a person is arrested and detained and is being booked. Can we include it on their booking forms at either at the uh, law enforcement or at our local jails to ask that question, have you served in the United States military, National Guard, or Reserve? That's important. Let's ask at the earliest point possible. 
As at the arrest booking, have you served in the United States Military National Guard ever in reserves? As at the initial court appearance or arraignment, whichever you have in your jurisdiction first, as soon as they're seen in court, have a person designated to ask that question. And we want to ask not just one time, but at multiple points in the process, because sometimes a person may not identify themselves initially as having served. And there could be a number of reasons as to why. It could be one of pride, one of embarrassment to disclose that here I am now arrested and I served in the United States military. It could be an issue where they're concerned about, does this affect my benefits? It could be a concern with regards to their uh, uh, security clearance. So it's important to ask at different points. In addition, we want to educate our local uh, defense attorneys, bar association, that when they're meeting and speaking with their clients, to ask their clients, have they served in the United States Military National Guard or Reserve? As we talk about developing a Veterans Treatment Court, it's important that we also discuss as part of this process, what is the Veterans Treatment Court structure? What's the legal status of someone placed into the Veterans Treatment Court? Is the model that you're going to have pre-plea where there has not been a determination of innocence or guilt, you enroll them into your program, and upon successful completion, the charges are dismissed. Is it revocable plea? Some jurisdictions have revocable plea if their state allows that to happen. A revocable plea is where a veteran enter a plea of guilty to a particular offense, that plea is allowed to be withdrawn upon successful completion of the Veterans Treatment Court program, and their charges are dismissed, or some other favorable resolution happens with respect to their charge. Is it a post plea where there has been a determination of innocence or guilt, and the court defers the sentencing with respect to that? And that post plea situation and deferral of sentencing is one in which the court affords them a full opportunity to participate in Veterans Treatment Court upon successful completion, then the, the sentencing is going to be a favorable one with respect to the veteran status. Some might take uh, probation cases. Some might also include probation revocation where a veteran was unsuccessful uh, at the probation setting, rather than sentence that veteran to imprisonment or jail, they afforded an opportunity to enter into a veteran's treatment court program, and then upon successful completion, of course, uh, that veteran is, is no longer facing the consequences of jail or imprisonment. In some, they use a combination of all of the above. Policy considerations is uh, for, and to have a discussion in your jurisdiction, does their discharge from the military uh, affect whether they're eligible for your Veterans Treatment Court program? Does it matter to your jurisdiction? Some jurisdiction might say, well, we want honorable. What if their discharge status is less than honorable? What if their discharge status is for bad conduct discharge? What if it's dishonorable? I don't have the answers for you except to say that is a policy consideration for your jurisdiction to review, to go over, to make a decision. What's best for us and under what circumstances will we accept someone into our program? It's important for us to define the entry process. What process get a veteran into our court? Are there barriers for that person to enter into our program? Many jurisdictions, they develop an entry process flow chart, beginning with the arrest to what happens after the arrest. The point of identifying a veteran into the program, 
the point of once the identification is made, notifying the representative from the VA so they could do a screening or an assessment to determine whether there's a clinical diagnosis of mental health, substance dependency, or combination of both that would warrant uh, entry into the Veterans Treatment Court program, the opportunity to have information submitted to the district attorney's office, to the uh, defense bar as to their status with regards to their health care, uh, the DA, defense counsel, the veterans can review whether the nature of their charge is one that creates and allow eligibility for your Veterans Treatment Court program. And to do that in the shortest amount of time. That's why an entry uh, process flowchart is good to do because you can see what is the time frame for us to get this accomplished and how soon can that case now be transferred to the Veterans Treatment Court program. Are there steps that need to happen before it enters into the program, such as is there uh, the contract? The contract that a veteran was signed to enter into the program, what does that happen? Does it happen in the originating court where the person signed their contract to enter in the Veterans Treatment Court? Or is the case referred to the Veterans Treatment Court and then the contract is signed and done then? With regards to if it's a um, either a revocable plea or a post plea case, who takes the plea? to enter into the Veterans Treatment Court? Is it the originating jurisdiction or the Veterans Treatment Court handles that once the case is received into their program? So that's an important step to analyze. Considerations before starting your Veterans Treatment Court is to develop a process and procedural manual. These things that we're discussing now, to have it memorialized in a process and a procedural manual. It's important for our veterans to have an understanding of, in order for me to successfully complete your veterans treatment court, what do I need to accomplish? It's important that they have a mission statement, a, a goal, a, a set of rules that is set out for them because they're good at following orders. So we need to set out what is the order for them. And that is done through a participant handbook. Developing the contract, we need to do that beforehand. What are the things that the veteran is agreeing to and that the court, uh, the district attorney, and everyone is saying that if you do these things, such and such will happen, a favorable resolution to your matter. So we need to develop a participant contract. Also, in our planning committee, we need to develop memorandums of understanding of all of the parties that we're working with and as to what each of our obligations are going to be in support of the Veterans Treatment Court. It's important that we have already developed confidentiality agreements and releases, communicating with the VA. What's going to be the appropriate release of confidentiality that will allow the court to receive updates on that veteran's process. We also need to think critically about developing a data collection plan. And that is, what type of information is important for us to record, to keep, to record, and retain, and be able to access for the future? Uh, what we like to know, um, our veterans, with respect to our veterans, what branch of service did they serve in? Uh, were they at any point in time deployed? What is their uh, MOS? What is their, their job specification with regards to uh, whatever branch of service they served in? What is their discharge status? What years of service? Do they have any children? What is their clinical diagnosis? Yes, we want to know that, but unless we begin to have a plan to not only record that information, store it in the management information system, and have the ability to retrieve that information, then many, uh, much of that information will be lost for the future and will be at a disadvantage when requested either by our funders, 
by our local elected officials, by our community, by our Office of Court Administration on how is our program operating, how is it functioning, who are you working with, what's the success rate, and that's important to develop a data collection plan. Part three, the operation, is um, this is the court where we want to do all that we can to not only address the underlying issues of our veterans, but it's substituting our treatment problem solving model for the traditional case processing. In Veterans Treatment Court, we follow the 10 key com components with modifications uh, for our Veterans Treatment Court program. But the key components is adapted from our drug treatment and mental health treatment courts. Also, I would invite everyone to download the best practice standards. And we're looking at the adult drug court best practice standards. But the research that's been correlated over 26 years when we're talking about adult drug court is of tremendous value and resource and guide for us. Uh, there's two volumes now, volume one and volume two. That is the website in order to uh, download it, www.nadcp.org slash standards. The key components, <clears throat> here they are listed. I won't go over them. I, there is one that I do want to highlight, and that's key component number four where it talks about Veterans Treatment Court provide access to a continuum of services and ancillary services. But one aspect of key component number four is having as part of your Veterans Treatment Court volunteer veteran peer mentors from your community. Veterans uh, are considered, these volunteers are essential to the Veterans Treatment Court program. Uh, they provide active, supportive relationship maintained throughout their time with you in Veterans Treatment Court, and it increases the likelihood that a veteran will remain in treatment and improves their chances for sobriety and law-abiding behavior by working with a volunteer uh, veteran mentor. Um, at this time, uh, we're going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Judge Vance Peterson. Okay, and uh, thank you, Judge Russell. It's, it's an honor and a privilege to work with you, uh, and I'm so pleased to be able to add a little something to an issue that's near and dear to my heart, uh, namely veterans. The information Judge Russell just presented is an outstanding blueprint for anyone setting up and maintaining a veterans therapeutic court and in understanding the role of the judge in that capacity. In late uh, 2009, our court noticed that we were getting a number of folks in with minimal criminal histories for the most part, but they were racking up charges at a much faster pace than those around them. We determined that one of our primary, one of the primary things that they had in common was military service. I'd heard something about a veterans court and began researching it and learned about Judge Russell and his court in New York and the rest is history. Uh, we shamelessly copied as much of his program as we could within our own local fiscal and political constraints and actually got our court up and running in September of 2010. Uh, my background and perspective is a little different than most. In my county with around 30 judges, I'm the only one with any military experience. I started my military career in 1975 as a brand new second lieutenant of infantry. The Vietnam War had just ended and I was an airborne ranger lieutenant in a peacetime army. All told, I spent 28 years active reserve and guard and resisted the temptation to become a JAG officer and instead spent six years in an, as an infantry officer and then branch transferred from the MOS 11B infantry, more about MOSs later, to the MOS that eventually became Special Forces branch. Uh, for want of a better term, I went to the Special Forces Reserve Qualification Program and became a Green Beret. The rest of my time in the military was in that capacity. After my active duty time, I went to law school, got on the bench in 1991, and still maintained my reserve and guard status, all the while serving in various joint headquarters where I became extremely familiar with the sister services, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, and even the Coast Guard. 
In 2004, after 28 years of service, I was mandatorily retired. I didn't like being retired. I had enjoyed it, and the thing I found that I missed the most was military culture, that, that team feeling you get as part of uh, military service. And then in August of 2010, just before we graduated our first group of Veterans Court defendants, I got a call from somebody in D.C. They asked me if I'd like to go to Afghanistan for a year as a combat advisor to an Afghan police unit up in Mazari Sharif. I told them I'd like to go to Costa Rica or I'd like to go to Hawaii, but instead, at the age of 58, I agreed to go in my now unretired military capacity. And that 248 days of boots on the ground up north in Afghanistan gave me an even greater insight into the people that were appearing in front of me in my veterans court. And who were these people coming into Veterans Court? They ran the whole spectrum of military experience, from the two-year Vietnam-era draftee to the 30-year uh, Marine lifer. They ran from the Navy supply clerks who just enlisted for the education benefits and then found themselves at Camp Leatherneck in, in, uh, in Afghanistan to the Air Force communication specialist who joined just for the travel and found themselves in remote bases in Iraq. They all shared the same experiences. They all shared that same culture. And when times were at their worst, it was that sharing that got them through the hardest of those times. The VA has stated that all service members share a culture. However, their individual experiences can vary tremendously depending on their branch of service, place, and time of service and military occupation. What their culture has in common has already been stated. They're used to structure. They know where they fit. They're used to leadership. They know where they are in their chain of command. They are fiercely loyal to their buddies, to their unit, to their country, and that means they're very patriotic. Veterans look at the flag differently. They hear the Star Spangled Banner differently because of their direct service to that flag. They have a camaraderie that cannot be duplicated in the civilian world. They can meet a stranger for the first time and be extremely close to that individual just because of a marking on the uniform or a qualification badge. They're used to teamwork, and through the common discipline they've received, they became self-disciplined and therefore self-reliant. And they experience this on a daily basis. There is no civilian job that can compare or give them all of those feelings at once. And because of these things, they form a bond that can't be duplicated. They belong to something much bigger and greater than themselves, and for the most part, they at least attempt to hold themselves to a higher standard than they had before they put that individual uniform on. And then they take that uniform off and then they're out, out of that comfort zone, out into the streets, back in the world, a world that sometimes they're at odds with. Many of the young troops in Afghanistan had a saying, we went to Afghanistan when everybody else went to Walmart. And most of these veterans feel a disconnect where, with the citizens that they serve, and yet they do feel a connection when they're with a fellow veteran, again, because of that shared culture. You don't have to be a veteran to be a veterans court judge. Judge Russell is the iconic proof of that. Uh, you don't have to be a veteran to be effective on a veterans court staff. But having a little knowledge of the culture of veterans can go a long way in establishing that relationship that's so vital between the judge, the court, and the veteran to get to the end product of a salvaged, crime-free individual. So let's look at the big picture here. Uh, let's see. I am not – oh, there we go. If you add up all the numbers here for branches of service, it totals around 2 million folks, and, and that's your current structure. Note that the Army has about half those people, and the Army veterans will more than likely make up about half of the veterans in your courts. To get a perspective of how disconnected many veterans feel, just look at the numbers comparing World War II to today. In 1940, the census indicated that we had 130 million Americans. By 1945, 16 million had served in uniform. That's one in eight. Today, that number is 320 million Americans, and those that are in uniform barely total 2 million. That is 1 in 160. In 1946, a veteran could probably talk to his neighbor down the street about his war. Uh, they could go to their local VFW or American Legion post, uh, which were much more established in that era. Today, that simply is not the case. If a newer vet wants to talk to someone who shared that experience, he's hard-pressed to find a fellow vet even in a crowd of people. That's where the mentors come in, and I'll, I'll get into that later. Um, during the Vietnam era, approximately 2.8 million actually served in-country. Most of them were active duty, either drafted or enlisted. The utilization of Guard and Reserve was minimal. And for years, the Guard and Reserve then were the weekend warriors who served that one weekend a month and two weeks of summer camp per year. 
The Army and Air National Guard had the dual mission of supporting the U.S. military and also supporting their home states in times of emergency, forest fires, tornadoes, floods, and the like. An interesting side note is that the Guard budget's paid for 50% by the state and 50% by the feds. As it stands now, the National Guard and the Army is comprised generally of combat arms branches. These are the war fighters, the infantry, the cavalry, the armor, artillery, combat engineers branches. The Army Reserve is generally composed of combat support and service support units, hospitals, transportation, supply units. The weekend warrior myth lasted almost up to the first Gulf War, Desert Shield and Desert Storm in 1991. When confronted with the need for over 600,000 boots on the ground, the Pentagon basically broke open the box and called heavily on reserve and guard units. They also called up a number of reservists who were augmentees. These were reservists who didn't have a reserve or guard unit to deploy with, but instead were assigned to active duty units to augment their needs. What happened afterwards, after the Gulf War in terms of guard and reserve, was an interesting phenomenon. Those who study such things became extremely aware of the concepts of reintegration, of decompression, Active units trained together before they went over, they fought together, and then they came back together and had a chain of command looking over their shoulders while they decompressed from the rigors of combat. The reserve and guard units had similar concerns, but the major difference was that on their return, unlike the active component units, eventually the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines in the reserve capacities were effectively on their own without that support that the active component had. And it was even worse for the individual augmentees. After their service and subsequent discharge, they were definitely on their own without that structure, without that support, without that chain of command, the leadership to, to follow on Judge Russell's comments on what veterans are used to, the loyalty, the patriotism, the camaraderie, the teamwork, and the self-reliance. In its place, anger and a suicide rate of over 22 a day. Afghanistan and Iraq proved to be much more of the same, over 2 million deployed, Active Reserve and Guard, uh, almost a million with multiple deployments, almost 600,000 Reserve and Guardsmen deployed, and folks, you don't come back from a combat zone with some very heavy-duty baggage. And unlike the preceding wars, it wasn't just the infantry bearing the brunt of the trauma. What an individual does in the military, their job is important to them, and it's incumbent on the court to know what that individual's job was, if for no other reason than to establish a better rapport with the defendants. In the Army, uh, that job is called a military occupation specialty. The de designation for infantry is 11B, and that'll be about 40 to 50% of your veterans uh, in your courts. The mission of the infantry is unique in humankind. It is simply to close with and destroy the enemy by any means available. You're not gonna find that in the civilian world. It's the dirtiest of jobs, and yet those that bear that MOS are extremely proud of it. And if at all possible, when the court engages that defendant, it's a good technique to ask them what their MOS was. Invariably, no matter what that job was, the individual will stand up a little straighter, and most of the time you'll see some kind of pride in their eyes. For the Air Force, that term is an AFSC. For the Navy, that term is a rating. Uh, the Marines have a different system altogether, and I can recall is that if you're a 0300 Marine, that's a form of infantry, and you'll see plenty of those. The wars of late have been very asymmetrical, very one-sided, in that we have bigger, better, and more equipment and people than the other side. There is no front line. All job skills in the various services are vulnerable to landmines, rocket attack, mortars, improvised explosive devices, and the like. Those latest two million combat veterans we have created have all been subject to extreme violence in some way, shape, or form. As stated earlier, uh, the active component had a little better edge in accommodating decompression and reintegration. The reserve and guard could still do a little better, uh, but just by virtue of their part-time configuration, it's extremely difficult to keep people bottled up when they're not full-timers. So the PTSD instances, the victims of TBI and, and, and military sexual trauma, are oftentimes unobserved and then untreated. And many of them are walking time bombs because they can't have and don't have that structure, leadership, and camaraderie. Some of them get benefits. Those who served over 20 years active can retire with a pension check equal to about 50% of their base pay. The percentage goes up pro rata per year served. They had a partial retirement system briefly that allowed them to retire in less than 20 years, but I believe that's over now. In the reserve system, guard or reserve, you can get, a, get in at the age of 18, do your 20 years, retire at the age of 38, 
but you don't get the retirement check or benefits until you're 60. That's an annuity system that favors the government. Once you get the check, however, you are entitled to full VA, VA benefits, and many of our veterans in court actually receive those benefits. But on our system, the best benefit is the counseling that the VA provides. As compared to the average citizen who has to pay for an alcohol or drug treatment program for the most part, the military retiree or military beneficiary can get excellent counseling through the VA, which is reinvent, reinventing itself in a very good way. Um, one of the best things that can happen in a veteran's court is the ability to link up deserving vets with services they never even knew they were entitled to. Veterans who are injured either on the job, in training, or in combat are entitled to disability benefits, the amounts being determined by the rate of disability, whether or not it was a combat event. If a veteran is retired, any rating under 50% is completely non-taxable amount in lieu of his pension. If the rating is 50% or more, that disability check is in addition. And again, many veterans who come before you do not know what they qualify for, and their negative contact to get them into court can actually open up a number of positive doors for them. As a veteran comes into the system, many of them are seeking leadership and structure and some form of identification with the system. They'll spend a significant amount of time with their attorney. They'll spend a significant amount of time with the probation, parole, or corrections officer. And to the extent that each one of them has some knowledge of the military, they'll be able to establish a rapport and engage in meaningful communication. But it is the judge that they generally have the deepest appreciation for. As I understand it, if a judge spends three minutes in a hearing with the defendant, even merely to grant a continuance, at the conclusion of the defendant's time in the system, the recidivism rate is reduced exponentially. It's important to engage the defendant, to ask them how they're doing, how's their work, how's the family, Note what branch of service they're in and when and where they served and if they deployed and if so where. It doesn't hurt to reflect on the unit uh, they were in. Taking three minutes to do a continuance can seem like a long time, but these words aren't just fillers. They're a chance to develop a relationship with the defendant and to maintain it and nurture it. Once they feel like they aren't just another file to you, the success rate goes up. On the plea or taking the negotiation or whatever on the first hearing when they get in the program, I ask them these questions and I annotate notes on the file, and then I can come back to them on subsequent hearings and engage them, and it does have a profound effect on the recidivism rate and a profound effect on the relationship. To them, the judge is the commander. That gives them some structure. The probation officer, correction supervisor is the senior enlisted advisor, the sergeant major, and that gives them some structure. They have a goal or a mission or a purpose, and they get some pride back in every positive step they take along the way in their treatment. If they can get VA services, that's a significant bonus because the VA folks are extremely culturally competent. For years, they've had a bad rap, but my read on the VA and their efforts today can only be described as Herculean. Once an individual gets into the system, they are provided with services that the normal person just can't get without insurance. Each state has a Department of Veterans Affairs that can also provide benefits as well, and there's still a big difference between federal VA qualification and state veterans qualification, and in some instances where the individual may not qualify for federal benefits, they may still be eligible for certain state benefits. The key thing here is that through the course of their veterans court contact, the individual defendant is given an opportunity to, in a certain sense, uh, come back to that military culture that they were comfortable in and recover from the demons that they faced when they got out of the military, whether PTSD, TBI, MST, drug or alcohol addiction, unbridled anger. They, they can be given a context to recover when they, re and at that point, then they can return home. The tip of the key is the mentor system. If you develop no other component for a veterans court, this is the one thing you need to have. Courts throughout the country have developed different kinds of mentor systems. Some are more active than others. All have been developed within the fiscal and political strengths of the various jurisdictions. The one thing they have in common is that the mentor is also a veteran. And that one factor makes all the difference in the world. I had a local politician observe our court in the subsequent forum that we had, and he loved it. And he, he got the idea that the mentors were the key, and then he wanted to know why we couldn't do it in the other therapeutic courts. And he might have something there, but I, I explained to him that the key here was that the veterans in the system shared a bond with the veteran mentors that really can't be duplicated. And it is that military affiliation. I can speak only for our court at this point, but much like Judge Russell's initial discussion, we recognize that in order for the system to work, we needed to do a number of things, and, and the most crucial was developing a mentor system. 
the mission for them simply was leave no one behind. We put together a 501c3, which we called the Veterans Forum. The mission of the forum was to support the Veterans Court, and it had two subunit missions that they were co-equal. One was to sponsor a monthly evening block of group therapy sessions, which were mandatory for the first six months of supervision for all defendants, and then voluntary th thereafter, the carrot being that for every forum they attended, the defendants got one month reduced in their probation, and two, to develop and maintain a mentor system. The mentors here are very active. The requirement is one contact a week with the defendant, either by phone, email, text, or in person, and normally it generates down to a, a personal contact. Um, one of the mentors' biggest challenges was overcoming that warrior mentality once they did meet with their charges. If you're a warrior and you're trained to go to war and overcome huge odds on a daily basis with your life being on the line most of the time, you develop a pretty tough shell. And you're not gonna let just anyone get through that shell unless it's someone who's been there too. Currently, we have 80 mentors in our system. Not all of them are active at the same time. Some of them actually carry up to three defendants. And all of these mentors are, are veterans. Many of them are from the same branch of service right down to the MOS or AFSC. On some occasions, they're paired up with a different branch, but the bottom line is, because of that shared military experience, that shared culture, they can generally easily penetrate that shell and get through that warrior mentality and get into the meat of the matter. Our mentors are volunteers uh, for liability purposes. They receive extensive, extensive local, local uh, training from volunteer professors from our local colleges. They're not there to narc the defendants out. In the case of a drug or al alcohol relapse, they're trained to convince the defendant mentee to self-report, which is the case over 90% of the time. They are, in effect, a friend, a buddy, an advocate. Mentors are not required to come to the court hearings, but most do, and on any hearing that a mentor is present, he stands at council table and is given the first opportunity to speak. Mentors are encouraged to come to the monthly forums. A half hour prior to the actual beginning of the group sessions, local charities provide a meal for everyone, and they're given an opportunity to break bread together. Every local asset for veterans has booths or tables set up around the dining hall, offering services from relicensing to pro bono attorneys, pro bono attorneys for landlord tennis issues, child support issues to VA, outreach programs, education benefits, housing and emergency services. Each mentor is trained about all these resources and actually can help the defendant navigate these systems. And again, what that mentor is not is a counselor. He's an asset. He can be a friend and is definitely an advocate. During the last events in Afghanistan and Iraq, almost all vets came home to groups of people thanking them for their service. That's, it's a good thing and I'm sure well appreciated. During the Vietnam era, that issue was not the case. Many veterans came home in ones and twos, depending on their D-row states, and were accosted by individuals taunting them, calling them names. It was a different world and a different America. I'd like to conclude by saying that when I went to the local VFWs and the American Legions and the combat vet the motorcycle riders here in, in my area and solicited to get mentors for what was in a new Veterans Court program, it was the Vietnam vets who came forward and unhesitatingly offered their services. It was the Vietnam vets who helped put the mentor program together. And it was the Vietnam vets who comprised the bulk of our mentor system. They wrestled with their own demons. They never forgot their military ethos and culture. And it was unfathomable for them to leave someone behind. Um, thank you. Have a great American day brought to you by great Americans who can't be here today. And Judge Russell, I'll turn it back to you. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And for those that are on the call, thank you very much for taking an interest in the subject of Veterans Treatment Court. It was a pleasure and honor uh, serving on this webinar with Judge Vance Peterson. And to Monica and Kerwin, we'll put it in your hands. Well, thank you, Judge Russell and Judge Peterson. I, I really appreciate the presentation. Um, <clears throat> it was really insightful, um, a lot of good information. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, so thank you both. Um, and I see Carolyn Cooper um, snuck on and, and joined. So, Carolyn, would you like to say anything briefly? Uh, no, just thank you, Judge uh, Peterson and, and Judge Russell, for the uh, in, ex, uh, 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 tremendously insightful uh, information that you're conveying, um, and I'm, I'm sure I want to thank everyone else that I see from a number of different states who are participating. Um, I think you know we're 
we're really at cutting edge issues every day, discovering new challenges that we need to share information on. So thank you very much. And Monica, I'm not sure if we have questions and answers here. Um, there's one I know that Lars, has, Lars Levy has referenced. Uh, we do not have any questions at this time. If anyone does have any questions or comments on the presentation, we do encourage you to submit those through the Q&A panel, which is at the bottom right of your screen. Oh, and there we go from Lars. Let's see. Uh, so here we go. With the advent of best practices for placement into our courts, what is the appropriateness of current risk needs assessment instruments for VTC participants who have generally minimal prior criminal justice or substance abuse involvement prior to entering? Well, the, with regards to, it, it's always important to have and to do the risk needs assessment. I know uh, National Institute of Corrections uh, with Greg Crawford, they're exploring and uh, now looking at an risk needs assessment, particularly geared toward veterans. I don't know at what stage there are. However, with respect to the issue of minimum prior criminal justice or substance abuse involvement prior to entry, uh, there is, when you look at the matrix of risk needs assessment, the biggest issue is going to be, is there a clinical need and what is the clinical need for a person entering into your veterans treatment court program? Some may not have or have minimum involvement in the criminal justice system, particularly if we're talking about uh, one of our younger veterans. Uh, who entered into the military at 18, 19, and you happen to see them in your court at 22, 23, or 24, 25 years old. They may not have uh, much of any criminal justice uh, background, but there might be a high need for treatment-related services. Now, if the issue is, one, that they don't have much of a criminal justice background and there is not a clinical need for treatment, then this being a treatment court, you're going to want to be working with individuals that have a clinical need. If it's because your jurisdiction wants to provide assistance to veterans, then you can look at a totally separate track where they're not in your veterans treatment court program, but you have a mechanism to provide linkages for services that they might be in need of, or have them able to access and speak to the volunteer veteran mentors. Or if you have in your courtroom representatives from the Department of Veteran Affairs, there could be other healthcare related issues, there could be benefits that they earn through their service that they can still, uh, how should I say, we call it, the line on the left, before our veterans treatment courts start, there may be individuals from our community, individuals that you might have in criminal justice that don't meet the clinical need for treatment or services, but still want to be able to speak to and uh, uh, some of the services and resources that we may have in veterans treatment court. Risk needs assessment, as we know through uh, some of the training that's been done, it's an important component because with the risk need, you talk about what's the level of supervision that's going to be needed for that individual. But if there is a high need for clinical services, you do want to have them in your Veterans Treatment Court uh, program, even though they might be of a low risk category. Yeah, I need low no risk. Take them into your program. <laughs> there you go. I think even if they have a, a minimal prior criminal history or uh, you don't see any prior substance abuse events, it can't hurt to run them through that assessment to, uh, simply because a lot of them, they don't know what, what their problem is and you can't tell just by looking at them. But on numerous instances, we'll get, say, a, a young lady in with uh, with an alcohol or drug problem or an assaultive behavior problem and it's her first offense or second offense, 
And in the course of that assessment, it is then determined that they've also been a victim of military sexual trauma, and it just right. puts them further up into the treatment scale. It, 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 I think it's, it's it very appropriate to have a risk needs assessment. Well, thank you, Lars, for that question. It was a really good question. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We have a couple minutes left. So, left. Excuse me. So, if anyone else, if there are any more any more questions, please uh, go ahead and submit them. And while they're doing that, uh, to Lars Levy, uh, thank you for that question, Lars. And uh, it's a pleasure to know that you were on the line with us. <laughs> Well, this is Carolyn. I have one question. Um, I know we're going to have a special sem uh, webinar on PTSD, but have either of you uh, found any special treatments or strategies for dealing with people with PTSD that you found, uh, you know, something that other programs might be interested in? We utilize the uh, United States Department of Veteran Affairs, and they have um, – and it may vary around the region as to what the available resources is from their local VA. Uh, but at the same time, not only do they have different approaches and having worked in that arena, uh, the VA, they got some uh, specifically geared treatment approaches with regards to those with post-traumatic stress disorder. They also have in our region, I know for us, we have some residential programming also for veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. But in addition, jurisdictions should also keep in mind the VET Center. And the VET Center uh, evolved from the Vietnam era where Congress set up a, uh, an entity which is part of the VA, but they have their facilities located not on the VA grounds where many of their counselors are veterans that are specifically trained in PTSD issues, counseling. Also, part of the benefits of the Vet Center is that they're, uh, they work with combat vets. They also are not limited in who they provide services to. In other words, family members of veterans they can provide services to the family in addition to the vets with regards to counseling and some of the experiences and challenges maybe the family has gone through living with a vet with post-traumatic stress disorder. We, we have the, the similar, the VA resources and the, and the outreach folks and um, we use them fairly extensively. It is good to note that there are family members involved and that there are capabilities to uh, or resources that we can use for the families. Uh, on our forums, uh, about once or twice a year, uh, we'll bring in uh, um, some of the local uh, department heads of psychology departments for some of the universities. And they, uh, I remember one class specific, specifically in that it's uh, you know, the effect of post-traumatic stress disorder on family members, and, and uh, all of them go through that program. And it, 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 it really does, I think, kind of bring out uh, uh, an element that all too often we, we kind of forget about, and that is the, the family members. So we, we rely, again, heavily on the VA, heavily on the outreach programs, and then we do have a, a local program that the VA uh, typically, uh, we have representatives there during each forum, and they, uh, I think they, kind of dovetail into that, that uh, uh, sequence that we have. Well, thank you. Uh, it looks like we have another question from Lars. Um, he said, in reviewing veteran treatment courts, I have noticed a large difference of services offered for honorably discharged vets versus less than, honorable, less than or dishonorable discharged vets. How have your courts dealt with this? <clears throat> In um, Buffalo and how we worked in, and dealt with that is that uh, depending on their discharge status, uh, a lot of times we'll discern whether they're eligible for the United States Department of Veteran Affairs VA health care services. Uh, if because of a person's discharge status, 
uh, they're not presently able to access VA health care benefits, even though for some we were able to upgrade their status with the VA where they were able to receive because sometimes people have undiagnosed injuries, undiagnosed uh, uh, injuries such as post-traumatic stress disorder, undisclosed military sexual trauma, things of that sort where they in the future may become eligible for VA health care benefits, but if on their first day in the Veterans Treatment Court they're not eligible, then we use our community health care treatment providers, which is part of our team as a whole, to provide uh, treatment services for these veterans. And, and it, it's interesting, uh, I had one fellow uh, come in front of me when we started our program and he was just sitting in the courtroom. He he was not uh, on the docket, and he went been in the standard criminal court and just happened to stop in. Turns out he was a Marine with 10 years of service who had been dishonorably discharged. And yeah. by our own standards, he would not have qualified, but for the fact that one of our mentors was there, he said, can I talk to him in the hall? He literally did go out and talk to him in the hall. Ultimately, the dishonorable discharge was upgraded, and they, they can do that. They upgraded it to, uh, um, I think, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't the fully honorable uh, discharge, but it was uh, less than honorable. However, that qualified him for his full uh, VA benefits, including education benefits. Mm -hmm. And the result of that was he ended up transferred to our program after he qualified. Uh, he just finished his master's degree, and he, he went back home to Louisiana. Isn't that uh, it's just wonderful. It's, it's, it went back to Louisiana. That's Lara's home state. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Well, he's a great guy and he's doing real well. Uh, the other so thing I, is, I think it, it, what you mentioned, Judge Peterson, is that sometimes it's not readily apparent what the circumstances that might have caused someone to receive a discharge, an unfavorable discharge from the military. Uh, but if their health care was a factor in it, uh, was a factor with regards to the nature of their service where they suffered sometime undiagnosed injuries, subsequent review thereof may allow that person to become eventually eligible for benefits and the health care at the VA. Oh, yeah. Many Vietnam vets who suffered some, you know, qualified for Purple Hearts, uh, they would serve for their two-year drafted period, and as soon as they got back and applied for VA benefits, they were turned down. Yes. And what has happened since is that the VA has changed their status or their standard, and they actually do qualify, but they don't know that they qualify, and since they were turned down, they haven't gone back. Yes. Uh, it, it, Many of them could get those services if they would simply apply. And that's why having a Veterans Treatment Court with a one-stop location for veterans with all these services really affords them the best opportunity to get stability uh, in their life again. And we can provide that service if a jurisdiction takes on that challenge to explore how can we service our veterans in our community by setting up and establishing a Veterans Treatment Court? And just for those of you who um, may not be aware, we did have a session on upgrading benefits and uh, discharge status that Levin Simone uh, led that is archived on our, web, our website. But it was interesting because he did make the point, which you both are making, that there's a distinction between upgrading benef entitlement to benefits versus upgrading discharge status, which are, I guess, two different processes. And that. Mm -hmm. uh, the benefits is something that may be e more easily done. So I don't know if that's your experience too. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, um, we talk about upgrading their status with regards to the VA for the healthcare benefits. And then uh, as I understand it, it's another process if you're talking about upgrading to the Department of Defense. Uh, for our immediate needs, we're looking to how are we able to upgrade their status to receive VA health care benefits and have that process reviewed so we can get them the coverage and the services and, and the benefits that they earn but are presently 
denied because of what their discharge status was. Well, thank you for that. Um, I have a question myself. Um, if you, you could both just to speak on, I know um, I, I mentioned to you both earlier, I went to a, a, a conference at Sanford University um, on veterans treatment towards this last weekend. And one of the issues that a lot of uh, jurisdictions that were present uh, mentioned was um, you know, the, the <clears throat> I guess the absence of their data collection. Um, so I was wondering if you could both could just speak on a little bit more um, on the importance of uh, data collection uh, for, for specifically veterans treatment courts and, and what data points may be different, I guess, in collecting, um, you know, uh, information or data from veterans treatment courses versus, versus I guess, other uh, treatment courts. Yeah, well, one of the key components to veterans treatment court and other treatment courts is a key component, I believe is key component number eight, the importance of data collection and having a management information system. It is extremely difficult to uh, keep everything on paper, put it in a file cabinet, and at some point in time ask a question about who you're seeing in your program and somehow having a staff member or yourself go through your filing cabinet to try to compile it. It is much easier if you do it right on the front end as you're planning your program to talk about what type of data do we want to collect, what type of data is going to be important and germane to show the progress not only of, uh, of our program but also who we're working with in our program. You're going to have funders that's going to uh, require that information. Your um, Office of Court Administration, the Prosecutor's Office, Defense Bar, everyone's going to want to know, tell me about your program and how is it working. It goes beyond merely giving some anecdotal example of how someone done in your program, but to be able to state we service in X number of people, X number of people have completed that program, X number of people have not reoffended the folks that we're working with. Uh, Twenty-five percent, fifty percent have served in combat. Whatever it might be, uh, you're going to be able to articulate that, and it's wonderful to be able to articulate that based on information that you collected and it's at your fingertips because you got a management information system, a a. Um, in your computer where you can merely push a button and that information is retrieved for you. Um, I know to American University there is a, the Buffalo uh, has uh, offered to the field its management information system uh, which is on uh, Microsoft Access. Uh, it can be utilized, it's given out to the field, American University has it for distribution, so anyone is interested, if you don't have a management information system, to have something that you could adapt and mold for your jurisdiction, American University has it, they'll distribute it for you. There's a staff person from our court uh, Jose Ferrer, who would help and work with you to put your forms and documentation on this management information system. Uh, whatever we can do to help and to assist the jurisdiction, uh, we will, because we want you to be successful. And also, the benefit of a management information system is you want to review as time go on, how is your program functioning and operating? Is it operating in the fashion in which you envision? Is it reaching the goals that you set out for your program? You're unable to do that if you don't collect the data and have the ability to retrieve that data once you collect it in an organized fashion. You can then be able to do a process evaluation of your program to see if there's areas you need to tweak or not in order to make it perform at its maximum efficiency what you initially envisioned for your program. You know, Judge Russell and I had this conversation earlier and data or data collection was something that 
is extremely important, again, just for displaying to individuals who are contributing to your program. One of the worst mistakes we made initially was we had not set up uh, exit interviews with each of the individual defendants who are graduating from the program. We've since rectified that, but it sure would have been nice to get to collect all of the data from day one. Uh, it is important and, and it really, amongst other things, shows what the recidivism rate is. There are different ways to, different formulas that are, that are used to uh, evaluate what a recidivism rate is. And it, it, it would be, it, it's nice to get some kind of continuity. It's nice to get a formula that uh, is, is fairly universal. And you can't get any uh, pattern of information absent gathering the data, and it has to be done timely. And again, we were very guilty of not doing exit interviews at first. We have since rectified that. Thank heavens. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for those responses. Um, and it looks like we do not have any more questions right now. I do just want to mention before we end this event that we have another webinar next Monday, May 16th at noon, and that's going to be on specialized housing units for veterans in prisons and jails, presented by Major Evan Simone and Warden Randall Liberty. Um, and that is going to be a really, really interesting webinar session. So I encourage you all to register for that. If you have any questions or concerns, you can always email justice at american.edu. Um, and Judge Peterson, Judge Russell, did you want to say anything else just to close out? For me, uh, this is Judge Russell, it's been a joy and a pleasure working with our men and women who've served, this, served our country and are having challenges uh, in their readjusting back home. I think that your experience will be similar to mine, uh, that uh, it is such a tremendous re resilient group. They just need the opportunity, the guidance on how to address the online health care issues and that uh, we as a justice system do appreciate their service to this country and that we, by bringing together the different resources, can really make a tremendous difference not only in their lives, their family lives, but the community as a whole. And I think Judge Russell just, just summed it up uh, perfectly. It, it's been an honor to work with him and with American University on this, this uh, event. I uh, can only say that, uh, you know, the, the, the country is coming together in terms of, of veterans and veterans' issues. It's been a long time coming. And I just want to thank Judge Russell again for being, being, the, being the godfather of this whole thing, uh, certainly uh, the veterans all over the nation appreciate what's being done. And thank you, Judge Peterson. Great. Thank you, Judge Peterson. Thank you, Judge Russell. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. I hope you have a great week. Yes.